My name is Tom Moore, I'm a senior lecturer in archaeology, a uh, specialist in the European Iron Age. At the moment my research is focusing on Iron Age opera, which are these large monuments that occur at the very end of the Iron Age, which many people regard as being the first urbanism in Europe. And I'm interested in exploring these sites in, in new ways to understand really whether they are the beginnings of towns in Europe, uh, or whether they're a peculiarly European Iron Age form of urbanism, um, and using different techniques to explore those kind of sites. One of the key characteristics of Opera is that they are massive complexes, often encompassing hundreds of hectares, so huge in scale. The ramparts are things like the Bracta are at least seven kilometres long. That means that we need to use new techniques to understand the layout of these complexes, their uh, arrangement in space and so on. In order to do that, what I'm trying to do is apply a whole battery of different archaeological techniques. That means large-scale geophysics surveys, LIDAR, which is using uh, an aeroplane to assess the topography of the ground, uh, also surface survey, picking up artefacts from the survey, and then finally as well excavation of a number of elements of these. And it's only by combining those different techniques can we really understand the arrangement of these sites, understand if they are urban, if there's dense settlement for example, and also the history of these sites. Um, so that's what, I'm, that's what we bring at Durham is all those different techniques to apply to these different sites. My recent focus has been on the site of Bagenden, which is in Gloucestershire in England, and this typifies some of the issues we have in exploring these large late Iron Age sites. It's massive in scale, encompassing at least 200 hectares, and as I say, we're applying different techniques to explore that site, so we've been doing large-scale geophysics to look at the whole complex, um, as well as targeted excavation of different elements. That geophysics is showing, for instance, that there's much more dense settlement than we thought before, so there are quite a large number of people living there. We've also been interested in looking at the antecedents of these sites. Many sites, both in France and Britain, actually only have a heyday for a very short period of time, perhaps just a generation or two. And one of the key questions is, well, where, how did they appear where they did? In the late Iron Age, we see this uh, amazing evidence of things like coin minting, uh, metalwork production, the presence of an elite at these sites. But how did that appear where it did? And that's one of the big research questions that we don't yet understand. So imagine that we've been using geophysics and we've identified new parts of the complex, new enclosures, and we've been excavating that. What that's showing is that actually there is an earlier phase to the site, and perhaps that had a special role itself. There's evidence from our faunal, that's the animal bone assemblage, which shows that there may have been feasting taking place there in the centuries preceding the oppidum occurring, um, and may have been of high status. What that's telling us is that there are perhaps important sites there already in the Middle Iron Age, before the Late Iron Age phase of these sites, which explains why those sites occur where they do. And that's really important in understanding so a much longer term development of these complex than we previously thought. In order to understand the diversity of these sites known as Opera across Europe, I'm also working at Bibracte in France and Burgundy. And this has a number of different issues about it. The site has been the centre of excavation for, for many years, um, but very little is understood about the environs of Bibracte, the area in which it developed, the rural settlements around it and so on. So with an international team, colleagues from Germany, from France and America, we've been looking and trying to understand rural settlements. What we've discovered is very exciting that we've got a massive unenclosed settlement just a few kilometres outside Bibracte, 100 hectares in extent. And that's showing us that actually Bibracte itself is not alone, that there are other large settlements nearby to Bibracte of equal status, so it has similar evidence of coinage, of a street layout and so on, also contemporary with Bibracte. Which means the scale of the settlement is much larger than we thought it was, perhaps a population of as much as 20,000 people living at that centre. It really shows the complexity of late Iron Age society at that time. So both of the sites that I've been investigating date to the end of the Iron Age. So it'd be bracked into the first century BC, British sites like Badgen and slightly later in the first century AD. And for many people these have been regarded as the origins of urbanism in Iron Age Europe just before the emergence of Roman towns. But in doing so, a lot of people in the past have looked at them in the context of Roman urbanism. So how do they compare to what we know, places like Cirencester in England, typical Roman towns? What we've been showing with the new research is that we need to think a little bit differently about these sites. Places like Bibracte have two discrete big centres of population. Bagenden has is huge in extent, but has large open areas as well as some areas of dense occupation. What this means is that we might be thinking about a peculiarly Iron Age form of urbanism, something which is very different from the classical urbanism that we're all more familiar with. 
That's quite interesting because that compares with a range of different forms of urbanism which occur across the world in the Americas in Southeast Asia at different time periods and a much bigger issue of are there alternatives to the way we think of urbanism which societies can develop to manage these large complex societies because at the end of the Iron Age we're talking almost proto-state-like organisation, large numbers of peoples, large territories, how do they manage organising that? Do they need towns or are they developing alternatives? Both of the projects that I've got in the field are not just research projects but are also about involving students and we have a range of students from all over the world working on our projects. So Durham students are working alongside teams from America, France and Germany, in Bibrac for example. It's also about engaging them directly in research on these projects so students are not just there helping out on the dig, they're actually undertaking part of those research projects. So we've had students for example working on the pottery from our surveys, even leading on to the publication of that in leading journals. So we're very keen on the fact that students at all levels, from undergraduate all the way up to PhD, are engaged at the cutting edge of the research on the ground, be it on the material culture side of those projects, or actually on learning new techniques like geophysics, like field walking, um, as well as excavation techniques.